get to the second episode of the series, and I wanted to add a couple things uh, into the record uh, before I post the second video. Um, that these are some things that came up in the comments of the first video that I wanted to either clarify or get y'all's input on. Um, the first thing is uh, support services. So somebody um, aptly came up with the idea that the special services should be renamed as the support services. So support services or special services. And that is not an apostrophe. I just write, I write very poorly. Um, so really it's up to you guys which one this should be named. Um, Honestly, I kind of like both. Special services has a little bit of a historic uh, significance, which I kind of like. Um, makes me a little bit biased, I guess. Um, but also, special services are going to be including things such as, uh, you know, obviously supply convoys is going to be the number one thing it's known for, but also um, things like engineering gameplay, uh, medical gameplay, and possibly e-war. Um, so... Currently, E-War is in the Precision Operations section, and I'm wondering if we need to switch it over to Special Services or even into the Navy section. Um, so, please put your input on this, which one of the three branches uh, you think it should be named. And for reference, um, remember we have our fleet, and below it are three branches. You have the Navy. You have the precision ops, and you have the either support or special services, also known as the SS. Just kind of a cool, cool name, I think. So you know, just choose which one you think you get. You guys think are going to be a better name, okay? Okay, so that was the first thing I wanted to get out of the way. Um, so the second thing is somebody um, also, another person aptly uh, came or aptly uh, mentioned the fact that we're when we're talking about a supply acquisition, uh, we are not talking about getting it from casual mining and bringing in or purchasing with money and bringing it in from outside sources. And the, the I want to describe what we're talking about a little bit more. And when we're talking about bringing in resources from very far outside of actual fleet combat, we're talking about um, resources that are coming in from the strategic layer, okay? So I wanna just kind of create a little box. And in this box is fleet combat, okay? Fleet combat. This is a closed system right now for me. The reason why is because I don't want to overly complicate this series, okay? So, fleet combat is taking place in a tiny box. There are inputs to the box, and there are outputs to the box, okay? The inputs to the box are things like people, resources, ships, even though ships are a resource, but you know what I mean. And the outputs in fleet combat are um, some like kind of benefit, benefit to whatever orgs are involved or whatever amalgams of orgs are involved, right? Um, however, everything outside of this fleet combat box, um, this big wavy thing of everything around fleet combat is the strategic layer. Oh, strategic layer. And I promise I'm gonna get better at writing. <laughs> All right, so that's the second thing. So for the purposes of not complicating this completely, we're not gonna discuss, we're not gonna discuss the strategic layer. Um, the strategic layer is going to include things like all of the org mining that was going on in EVE Online, for example. Um, it's going to be where you're really building up the kind of uh, currency that you need to fund these huge fleet battles, right? Um, so I just want to clarify that. 
And then the last thing is um, in this uh, episode, I talk about supply acquisition. I call it, quote, supply acquisition. And I wanted to clarify something. Please, when you're watching this, please delete supply acquisition from your brains because I realized it's a very poor terminology. So we're going to cross out acquisition and we're going to call it supply vectors. Okay? They're going to be called supply vectors. And in the in the I'm warning you in the episode I'm I'm not going in and editing it out cuz my editing skills are not that great. But in the video I call them supply vectors. Or I mean I call them supply acquisition. They're actually supply vectors. And um, to make it even more clear, these include foraging slash looting. These include supply on hand. On hand. Uh, Baggage train. Uh, supply depots and convoys and then also this is not mentioned in the rest of the episode either but there is a sixth one that I'm not talking about and it actually falls uh, I'm going to talk about how there is actually a order to these different uh, different concepts and um, Something to keep in mind is that there's another one, and it's going to be cannibalization. And I'm trying to figure out where it fits. It's probably going to fit somewhere in here, uh, but it's going to be cannibalization. And to describe cannibalization for just a second, all cannibalization is is you have a good ship and you have a broken ship on hand, like you, you, they're both in the hangar of your carrier, for example, and you just cannibalize the broken ship to put those parts onto the good ship to make the good ship even better. That's cannibalization. Or if you have two broken ships, you destroy one so that you can fix up the other one. Um, I suspect cannibalization will be heavily used. Um, not just in terms of resources that you have on hand, but also probably in terms of resources that you come across. So, for example, shipwrecks, etc. That it can be seen as a type of supply acquisition, uh, but it is a supply vector. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, without further ado, this quick insert is already running long. Um, have fun watching the video. Combat theory. This episode is going to be touching on a very important concept, which is why it's being covered in the first true episode of the series, and that concept is resource management. As I've been saying before, uh, resource management is going to be one of the critical components of this game, and without proper attention to detail and good logistics, uh, any kind of fleet that's engaging in a conflict is not going to be able to hold out against a you know a, another fleet that is using these concepts against them. I want to start out with a very basic example of what we have in the game, kind of right now, uh, although it's not as noticeable as I believe it will be later on. I want to take just one person. Mind the low res. And think about the things that you need in Star Citizen as of today, as of 3.17.3, you require oxygen. And this, these are kind of in, in like descending order, right? Like oxygen is the number one thing that you have to have immediately, right? Like if you, without oxygen, you die almost immediately. You need a temperature and pressure. We're going to be considering that a resource. Um, obviously... These resources are going to be coming from something else, like battery packs on your suit, for example. Um, but because we don't really know a whole lot of you know, how energy is going to be working and where energy is going to be coming from, for now we're just going to call it TNP, which is just climate. It is life support, right? If you freeze to death, you'll die, right? So you need oxygen, 
You need temperature and pressure, you need food, and you need water. Those are the four resources that you must have to survive. Kind of falls under the idea of um, food, water, and shelter, you know, the, the basic needs of survival. But in space, obviously, oxygen is a concern. Some additional objects uh, that we might want to think about are equipment, um, which I'm just going to call EQ for the sake of simplicity. And, you know, things like med pens and ammunition, right? Um, and as the, so as of right now, those are the resources that you need just for yourself in the game. Doesn't seem like a big deal when you play, does it? Because, you know, you're always watching out to make sure you have your helmet on. So you always have oxygen. And you don't have to buy oxygen. You always have a suit on, which is part of equipment, which regulates your temperature and pressure. But you need you don't need batteries for that suit right now, and you don't need inner, you don't need um, oxygen or whatever gas they end up using for your thrusters either. If you're an EVA, food is not really m that big of a deal because you know you're playing the game. You roll you know you roll on by a station. You notice that your character is at like thirty percent food. So you go down there, and you grab a burrito from the local stand, and you're good. You don't even have to think about it that much. If you're like me, maybe you even keep food on board your ship. You know, it's easy enough. It's cheap. You know, like 8 Alpha UEC for like a little, you know, uh, MRE kind of meal, you know. It's not, it's not hard. H2O, water. A little bit more of a concern because it, it depletes so much faster than food does, especially if you're, you know, in rigorous exercise. So running around on a planet that's hot or engaging in FPS combat, you'll run out of water much faster. But when you put it all on paper, it, it looks a lot more complicated than it feels, right? So keep that in mind because the point that I'm going to be making in this video is that logistics for a fleet is going to be a lot more complicated than I think many people realize. One person requires all of these things. Let's scale it up just a little bit. Let's say you're not just one person, but you're a person in a fighter craft. And if you have been watching, if you watched the last episode, you'll understand that this is the symbol for a fighter. It's, you know, my drawing skills need to improve. I realize that, but I'll get better as time goes on. So we have our little fighter craft, fight, fight, fighter craft. Let's say it's a Gladius. And what what things do we need for the Gladius to for it to function? Well, as of right now, we need hydrogen fuel, which I will be using H plus to designate. Uh, I use H plus because it sounds like hydrogen particles, um, hydrogen ions are being used uh, for like you know chip thrust. So H plus is what I'm going to be using for that. We also need quantum fuel which I'm also going to say is Q+. I realize that quantum fuel is a, you know, an obtainium kind of stuff, but I just think that these go well together. And any time H+, and Q+, are mentioned, the plus signs will help us remember that these are fuel items, right? Um, I might even have, later on, if we need, at, like, other sources of energy on board our ship, which it sounds like we might need, I'll be designating them with E+. But right now, we don't need those, right? So, let's, for the sake of this discussion, let's leave it out. And then finally, if you're running a ballistic aim, a ballistic loadout, which right now you shouldn't be, but if you're running a ballistic loadout, you'll also need ammunition for the Gladius. Okay. That seems all well and good. That seems pretty simple, right? Well... Let's go ahead and take a look at a typical mission that you would run in the game right now and what kind of what kind of supply issues you might run into just by the nature of you going and doing a mission. So let's say you're on Port Alasar and you want to go to Security Post Caria and you're going to run a mission there to get from point A to point B you have to travel to Selen this is going to be selling. And so you have to jump like this. And then you'll jump, just jump straight to SPK or go through an OM or whatever. Just to get there, 
what do you have to expend? Well, you're going to expend a little bit of hydrogen fuel because you have to fly around a little bit to point around and get there. You're going to expend a more so quantum fuel because you have to make the jumps. You're not expending ammunition because you're not in a fight yet. You're not expending any equipment or med pens or anything like that, but you are expending food and water. Just because food and water always are depleted no matter what you're doing. Okay. These are the four things just to go from point A to point B. You're expending these four resources. Now, you're not expending a whole lot of them, but you're expending a little bit. Okay. And this is just a very tiny example. So once we get to Security Post Caria, maybe we land on board the station and we go in and we fight, I don't know, some bounty hunters or fight some criminals if you're a bounty hunter, and you engage in combat, okay? And let, let's say you succeed in your mission. So you engage in combat. What resources have you used? Well, you've used ammunition from your Gladius, most likely. You've used a lot of hydrogen because you've had to boost and stuff like that because Remember, it's, it's SPK, so more likely than not, you're going to be fighting outside the station as well. So you're expending a lot of hydrogen. You're expending ammunition from your Gladius. And then once you land and engage in combat there, you might be expending O2, although right now O2 is not an issue, but let's just keep it in mind. You're expending O2, you're expending food, and you're expending water, and... Uh, ex you're probably also expending some equipment, so like your ammunition and med pins. I'm not going to draw it here, but you're expending those as well. So by the end of this, of all of our resource you know, supplies that we have had going in, what all have we expended? Do we expend oxygen? I mean, right now in the game, no, but eventually, yes. So I'll just put a check there. Did we expend our TNP? Indirectly, yes, eventually energy needs will factor into temperature and pressure. But for right now, let's just leave it alone. Uh, I I, th I want to stress O2 because I want to I want to get people in the mindset of O2 is a very is going to be a very critical resource because once you run out, you're dead. Okay, TNP. Maybe you'll have a little bit of leeway there, but O2, no. Once it's gone, it's gone. <laughs> Once it's gone, you're gone. Food. Yeah, we expended food because we got hungry, you know, after our, doing our mission. Oh, and remember, after SPK, we're jumping back to Port Alisar as well. So we come full circle. So that's mo minus more, you know, of all this. We expended water. Did we expend any equipment? Right now in the game, no. But remember that the devs have said that... Um, the equipment is not going to be... They're not going to have unlimited lifespans. We're going to have situations where your guns degrade, your suit degrades. Eventually, they have to be replaced. So, you've used your equipment as well. I'm not going to go through it now. But in the game right now as well, a lot of the times, if you run out of ammunition in your gun, what do you do with it? You drop it. You drop it and you grab another gun. So you might lose the gun you came in with, but you might get another one. So for now, we're going to ignore that technicality. You've probably expended med, kit, med pens if you've gotten shot or if you ran upstairs. And you've expended ammunition. Your Gladius, you've expended all three of these in the process of the mission. So in the final, set of the, in the final state of the game, how many of these resources have we expended in going out and doing our mission. Well, in the final state of the game, we've used all of them. You know, let's just go ahead for now, I guess, and check these two, assuming we're at the end, like the final state of the game. Okay? All of these resources are important. If you don't have ammunition, you can't fight once you get there. If you don't have hydrogen fuel, you can't fly once you get there. If you don't have quantum fuel, you can't make the jumps. If you don't have oxygen, you die. If you don't have TNP, you'll eventually die. If you don't have food, you'll die. If you don't have water, you'll die, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So all of these resources are necessary. And look at this. Just for one person and their little gladius, how many types of resources do we have to contend with? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. At least, 
10 resources, 10 types of resources. And we're not even getting into the nitty gritty of what equipment to bring. Like if you're bringing sights and you're bringing pistols and knives and all that garbage, right? So 10 different types of resources just for one player and their gladius or whatever fighter ship we're talking about. Now, we're going to go ahead and kind of um, switch gears a little bit. We're going to move on to a different use case. So let's say we're our little person, and instead of fly, flying our Gladius, we're actually flying um, a, let's say it's a Crucible, okay? We have our engineering, because the Crucible is an engineering ship. Um, it is technically classified as large, but it has a dedicated role, so therefore it is going to be considered an engineering vessel. All right, just bubbling that in. Maybe the maybe the center of gravity symbol is not the best symbol to use for this, but anyway, because it takes forever to draw. But anyway, let's say we have a crucible. Okay, what kind of stuff are we going to need for that? See, with the Gladius, all we needed was hydrogen fuel, quantum fuel, and ammunition. With the Crucible, well, we're going to need all that, yeah. Say we, we'll say we'll need that. What else are we going to need? We're going to need hull material. All right. We don't know everything about. Um, we don't need everything. We don't know everything yet about repair gameplay. But in order to do your job, you're going to need hull material, and that's sorry for my handwriting. I need to get better. But we're gonna, you're going to need hull material. You're going to need um, repair tools. Um, what we'll just call that equipment for now. Let's see if I can draw this without being awful at drawing. Hull material, equipment, like repair tools. Um, yes, not salvage lasers, but actually you might need salvage lasers for this. Uh, but the repair attachment on the multi-tool that they've been talking about, etc., etc. You're going to need that. You're going to need ship components, like spare ship components. And you're going to need, like, relays, because they've been talking about how important the relays are. So you're going to need spare relays to help put in people's ships. All right. You're going to need cutting attachments, maybe. That, that falls under the equipment. So now you have all these other things that you have to worry about that are, that are not, that, that the Gladius user doesn't have to worry about because they're doing a combat role. And they're not expending the kind of resources that you're expending for your role. And then this analogy can be transported to a whole bunch of different applications. Um, you can talk about mining. What do you need for mining? There's a host of things that you need. Mining heads, new mining heads. You need uh, the um, little mining gadgets and stuff like that. What if you have a hacking ship? What if you well, your individual is a hacker and you need hacking chips, et cetera, et cetera? Every different role in the game is going to have different resources that are required for the proper function of that role. And as somebody great once said, without the right tool for the job, that job's going to be a lot more difficult. In fact, without the right tool for the job, that job might be impossible. So we have to bring the proper resources. There's another problem with the Crucible that you might be thinking about, and that is that the Crucible is a large vessel. There's not going to be just one person on there using up all of these resources that we talked about down here, but there's going to be a whole bunch of people. So these resource, all of these like uh, resource um, requirements that one person needs are going to be like multiplied by like five or six or whatever, whatever the crew of a crucible is. So you see, right now, resources are cheap and easy to come by. But eventually, they're going to be more difficult to come by. And this is going to be a little bit more difficult to plan. And then eventually after that, once you're dealing in the fleet, once you start scaling this up, it's going to be a big problem. And that's what the next thing I want to talk about is the issue of scaling. You see, when we're talking about fleet combat specifically, we're not just going to have one person. We're not just going to have one ship. We're going to have fleets of ships. You're going to have your capital class sh ships. You're going to have your large ships. You're going to have your heavy fighters and your f interceptors and your fighter craft 
and you're going to have your torpedo boats and your bombers and everything else, right? Maybe not an actual fleet engagement, you have the bombers, but you know, you see what I mean. You're going to have your dropships, you're going to have armor columns, you're going to have all these things that all need their own resources. Armor columns are going to need resources that dropships won't need. Dropships are going to need resources that fighters won't need. What, you ask? Well, what about all the extra oxygen you need to transport all those people, right? Torpedo boats are going to need resources, like torpedoes, that other ships don't have. And bombers are going to need bombs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You see, and once, and, and remember, in a fleet, actual fleet combat scenario, you're not bringing just one of these. You're bringing, like, maybe 20 of these guys. You're bringing, like, 50 of those guys. You're bringing, like, five frigates. So you're bringing, like... 10 large vessels, and on and on and on. You see, all of these things will add up. That 8 Alpha UEC that you bought for that one burrito at the little convenience store on Port Tressler, how many of those do you think you're going to need to actually get like enough food to sustain your fleet? Okay? So that's what you have to think about. And that brings us to the next problem. Where do you store all those burritos, right? That's the next issue. So we're going to zoom out here. And we're going to find it a blank area of the page. And we're going to also increase the size of this because it's starting to get a little bit difficult to see. So next we're going to talk about how do we realistically manage all of these resources? Because that's what this video is about, resource management. How do we manage all of the stuff that we have to keep on hand? And we have to keep it on hand. You cannot rely on foraging, okay? So we'll talk about that. So first, before we talk about the storage, okay, let's talk about resource acquisition. Yeah, I'm butchering acquisition, I know. Eh, okay, there we go. All right, and I'm actually going to move back to the smaller. Okay, so resource acquisition. How do we acquire resources? Well, in descending order, or ascending order, however you think about it, let's talk about the most convenient options. The most convenient thing you can do is foraging. Foraging. Okay, let's actually zoom back in because it's kind of hard to see this. And I'm going to move over. There we go. So foraging is the number one thing. What's great about foraging? And you could also call this looting, right? You blow up their fleet. You take all of their resources. You have their stuff. You drop back behind their lines and do some guerrilla warfare, and you capture their convoys. And we're going to talk about all that later. And you take their resources, and it's free. You've taken it. That's the best thing that you can do. That's number one, right? This is this is great, but this is inconsistent, as you know, as you might be aware from all of human history, from the Romans to uh, modern times. Foraging is an inconsistent way to feed an army, uh, and an army marches on its stomach. So, how do we get a little bit more? better than this. All right. Well, the second best thing you can do is to bring the supplies with you. You can have it in a cargo bay. And we'll call this, um, uh, let's call it supply on hand. I actually didn't come up with a name for this, but we're going to call this supply on hand. And this means if you're flying in a Polaris, you have the resources that you need for your for your crew for a certain period of time on your ship, okay, in the cargo bay. It's supply that you have on hand. All right, that's the second best thing because right in the midst of a battle, you have everything you need right there in the cargo bay. What's the problem with this? Well, this, this is going to be limited, right? You can't carry a whole lot in the cargo bay of a Polaris. Sure, you've got a good amount of space, but you don't have all the space you need, and you're only going to be you're only going to have enough supplies for a limited period of time. Especially if you're in the midst of a prolonged combat engagement where you're burning through resources like it's no tomorrow. 
right? And then we're gonna come back up to here. This is inconsistent. Boom. Okay, so forging, supply on hand, that's limited. What's the next best thing that you can do? Well, the next best thing that I'm that we're gonna talk about is what I'm gonna call the baggage train. And that, you know, for anybody who knows anything about um, medieval history, they are aware of a thing that used to be used called the baggage train, where essentially everything that the army needed came on carts and by horse and oxen, and people's families lived on the baggage train and helped with supplies and all of that. And that followed the army around everywhere it went. This is very useful in our current analysis of fleet combat because it means you can have a whole supply fleet right behind your fleet that you can go and resupply at during an engagement. You can be bringing in fresh ships to a fight. You can be bringing in fresh ships to the fight. And then you can be pulling them out when they've expended all their resources. Like, for example, we have our, our torpedo boat. And he's got, like, let's say three torpedoes, and he go he burns through all every single one of them. He flees combat, goes back to the baggage train, and the baggage train has, like, you know, nine fresh torpedoes that they can install there. And then he comes back into the fight after resupplying with three torpedoes. See how that works? You keep doing this shifting in and out. So that's the baggage train. What's the problem with the baggage train? Well, uh, and actually, like, you know, you, you can see this example, uh, a brief, just a really brief example. Let's say here's the, the in, well, I would call it the infantry line of your fleet. The baggage train is at some kind of somewhat safer location. I don't know why I'm using that symbol for this. Here's your baggage train. And ships are just coming in and going out, right, to resupply and join join the fray again, right? What's the problem with this? The problem with this is that if you're a good fleet commander or if your enemy is a good fleet commander, this is the prime target. You break this guy first, and then the rest of the fleet ends up crumbling because they can't resupply, at least not quickly enough. So they're going to come in. And they're going to try and attack this, right? And that's the issue with the baggage train. Because at the end of the day, it's vulnerable. Well, Boldy, I can just leave a bunch of ships behind to protect the baggage train. Well, yeah, okay, that's fair. But what are you doing if if you've got like half your fleet back here protecting the baggage train? It means you've only got the other half of your fleet out in in the actual fight. So there's a balance, right? You have to make a, as a fleet commander, you have to make a critical decision. And it's probably going to be a minute to minute kind of thing. How safe is the baggage train? Like every 10 minutes, you're thinking, okay, how safe is the baggage train right now? 10 minutes later, how safe is the baggage train right now? And I just dropped my pin. Give me one second. So you have to make that critical decision. And because you have to pull ships off the front line, it's it means that the baggage train is a little bit of a liability. So there's a vulnerability here, okay? If it's not vulnerable, it means that you're probably taking a bit too much off the front line or you don't have it positioned well, right? Or if or rather if it isn't if you if you do good positioning, you can set up your baggage train so that it's in a position where it's relatively safe. But anyway, that's beyond the point. Okay, so what's the next step after that? Well, the last... Well, actually, there's... This one's kind of a twofer. So you're going to have... You're going to have... Supply depots, okay? Supply depots. Now, what is a supply depot? Well, we know that they're planning for us to al- they're planning to allow players to build player-made bases on planets and moons, okay? Supply depots are going to be those player bases that are built for holding cargo 
and resources that you use to establish a presence in a certain area. So let's say you're a fleet and you want to go to, you're in Pyro, and I don't remember the names of the different planets in Pyro, but let's say you want to go and establish a presence on uh, one of the moons of Pyro 1. Okay, so here's Pyro 1. And then here is like the moon one, moon one. Okay, you want to establish a, a presence right here. Okay, well, the best way to do that is to set a supply depot here. You bring a pioneer with you and you build a supply depot on moon one. Okay, and then if your fleet is nearby in Pyro, you can always be coming back to the supply depot for um, resupply, okay? Now, what's the issue with this? Well, bringing your whole fleet back to one location for a resupply is somewhat dangerous, and also, it's a little bit unwieldy, right? Like, all of those ships trying to resupply from one area at a time. Um, and also, supply depots are going to be uh, a bit of a problem because they're pretty much immobile. So let's just say I'm going to call it immobile and clumsy. The way that you get around this is you use convoys. Convoys. And so this is something that we've seen in Chris Roberts games like Wing Commander and we see it all over the place in different space games, but usually in every single space shooter, there's that mission where you have to go in your fighter craft and protect the convoy. That's such a classic mission. It's very fun usually because there's that added stress involved of them trying to attack the transporters and you've got to protect the transporters, blah, blah, blah. So the, the way that you do this is you have couriers or supply ships. So remember, supply ships are designated with the arrow like this. And couriers are just a simple arrow. And you have couriers or supply ships bringing stuff to your fleet and then back, right? This is actually very uh, useful because it means that um, you don't have to be right at the supply depot, which means your fleet doesn't have to be there and that you don't give away the position of your supply depot to your enemy necessarily, right? Because your whole fleet's not moving there and being a giant, you know, red flag saying, hey, a supply depot's here, right? So smaller ships like couriers and, you know, supply ships and the like can be moving back and forth from the su supply depot to your fleet and back and forth, right? What's the problem with this? Well, like the baggage train, supply depots are going to be vulnerable. In fact, because they're not a static target that you could you can dedicate some serious resources to protecting, like the baggage train, um, they're going to be much more vulnerable than the baggage train because they're out there alone in route from here to here and here to here. So they're going to need escorts and things like that sometimes, usually. And that's another thing that the fleet commander or the subordinates can make a call on. In fact, that might be something best for the foreman of the supply depot to make a call on, is does this convoy that's heading to the fleet need a supply depot? Or, I mean, it's need, a, need an escort, right? And so now you're going to ask me the question, well, what's the best option? What's the best option here? Because you said this is inconsistent. Foraging and looting is inconsistent. Supply on hand is limited. Baggage trains vulnerable, convoys are even more vulnerable, and supply depots are immobile and clumsy. So, what's the solution? Well, the solution is all of these. All of them. You use all of these different things so that you, you forge and loot. You take advantage of every opportunity to gain more supplies because you might as well do it while you have the chance. You... Um, you always want to keep enough supply on hand for a little bit of period of time in case something happens to everything else down the chain and foraging's not working out. You want to keep a baggage train around. Now, they're, they're, I, the baggage train in and of itself, the entire concept of it, might be something that you have on hand or not. Okay, 
The next episode in the series is going to be on the baggage train where I'm talking about that in a little bit more detail. So you might say, well, I'm just going to use supply depots and convoys. Or you might just say, I'm just going to use the baggage train. It's going to depend a lot on where you're going and what you're doing. If you're, if you're establishing a presence in an area, probably going to put down supply depots. That's what the Romans did. That's how the Romans did their thing. But if you're not going to be establishing a presence, if you're just in there to raid or to, to hit and run, baggage train. Um, and if, if you're, if you're hitting a really soft target and then getting completely out, you don't even need any of this. You just need the supply on hand and maybe some foraging and looting, right? So all of this is going to be used and then all of it's going to be used for different reasons and maybe all at the same time as well. All of these are options, right? So that's resource acquisition. Okay. So I just zoomed way too far out. Now, access to supply is critical. If you don't, if you lose access to all five of these, you're toast. Your fleet's toast. Because at the end of the day, they're going to be able to resupply much faster than you can. Okay? And to kind of explain myself when I say that, uh, we used this example before. With the, uh, let's say it's a retaliator. Actually, it might be more like an Eclipse since it only carries three missiles. Eclipse comes back, resupplies, goes back out there. What happens when this guy's no longer here anymore? That Eclipse is now useless. Completely useless. You might as well kamikaze it in and try and eject and hope for the best, right? You have run out of this critical unit asset because you did not have the proper resources to back that asset up. See how this works? Ships and assets in your fleet are only as good as your resource management skills allow for. Once you run out of them, everything else goes to pot. It means that your, your, even your um, foot units, like your ground units, even they are going to have issues. Because once you start running out of food and oxygen, imagine that. What happens if you start running out of oxygen in the middle of a battle? You have to flee. You have to set retreat. And retreat is not going to be a good thing. That's also another problem with the baggage train, by the way, is that in order to efficiently cycle people in and out of a battle, you probably are going to have to make a jump because, well, we're going to be talking about this later because there's multiple strategies for using the baggage train. Um, and then there's like a risk reward factor as well. But anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that later in another video, probably the next one, which will be uh, focused on the baggage train. Um, so if you don't have all the resources you need, you are going to be out of luck and your fleet will be out of luck and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, in every single one of these videos, I'm going to try and honestly, it's not, I don't usually have, I'm not going to usually have to try very hard to do this, but I'm going to show how if you are not a member of a fleet, how you will be interacting with this whole system. And I have a big one planned for the baggage train, okay? And you're going to kind of see where I'm coming, where I'm going with that here at the end of this video. But let's say you know of this big fleet, and you know that they're engaged in combat, and you know that there's a baggage train nearby, and you are, as I said in my last video, a guy who sells bananas out of the back of his cutlass. Well... What can you do to make a profit here? Hmm? Well, you can go up to this fleet here, maybe towards the rear of their lines or whatever, so you don't get shot down, and you can try and make a trade with them. You can say, here's my little courier ship, because I'm just a one-man cutlass acting in a courier capacity, and I'm like, hey, can I make some money? Like, you want to buy all my goods? And they might be like, hey, you know, we don't really need bananas, but why don't you go sell those bananas and buy some missiles and bring them back, and we'll buy those. So think about that. You can bring all sorts of equipment and resources in. They actually might take the bananas. You never know. But you can bring all sorts of equipments in directly, and they are 
it's possible that they will go ahead and buy your goods without even consulting with the baggage train because of the importance of supply on hand and the fact that they don't have to run back. This is even more exaggerated when they don't even have a baggage train. They're only relying on supply depots and convoys. So keep that in mind. Solo players, you're going to have a lot of money to make off of following these fleets around. Okay? And that, the same thing goes for mercenary work and all that. I'll get to that in later videos. But for now, understanding what resources a fleet is going to need, because they're going to need a lot of them, will help you make a lot of money in the game. And I think that we're basically done. Uh, there's another thing that you can do um, as a solo player. You can sign up to, to, to fa be part of this convoy to ferry supplies from one position to another. Also, for piracy orgs, think about this for a minute. For piracy orgs, okay, you're not even, you don't even care who wins the engagement. You don't care. If, these, if this is Explore and they're fighting like Test Squadron or some, somebody, something like that, boom, boom, you know, explosions, blah, blah, blah. What do you care about who wins this engagement? In, in like, you know, nine out of 10 scenarios. Like there might be some ca cases where like, you don't want, you don't want test squadron moving in on your area. So you want to support one side of the, uh, over the other. But seriously, if you're not part of either of these orgs, wh what do you care about who wins? If I were a pirate in this scenario, I would look, I would maybe take some scouting go out and look for baggage trains, see where they are, and be like, this one's pretty undefended. I'm going to come in, and I'm going to hit this baggage train real hard, and then I'm going to get out with my, you know, 15-person org, right? See how that works. And then, um, furthermore, you like, if you're not a pirate, maybe you're a data broker, a uh, data an information broker, you have a little exploration ship. You you just take your little scout ship. And I don't have a symbol for scouts yet. I really need one. I, re I recognize that. It might be the uh, magnifying glass. Although that doesn't look great. So I don't know. I don't know about that. But anyway. Let's just say we have a little magnifying glass ship. And I'm a data broker. I can come in. I can find this baggage train. I can see what its position is. And then I can go right over to Test Squadron and say, hey, hey, guess what? I know where their baggage train is. Give me a million a million UEC and I'll tell you where it is, right? These are things to think about. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things about how this gameplay is going to work that's going to generate a ton of gameplay opportunities. And there's going to be tons of people running in and out trying to make the best of the situation. And as a fleet commander, you have to be thinking about this stuff. Maybe the guy who's coming in to sell Bluth's bananas to you is like also intending to turn around and go sell your information to Test Squadron. So maybe you have standing orders not to let anybody come. Or maybe you're out of resources and you're desperate and you have standing orders to let everybody come in. So I hope that this video has helped you to understand a little bit more about resource management and how that will likely end up working in the final state of the game. This is how things are shaping up to be, uh, based on all of the videos and stuff that have been surfacing ever since CitizenCon and before that. If you find this series useful to you and you think that it's something that you want me to keep doing, please like and subscribe and put a comment down below. Uh, feel free to argue with me and tell me where I'm wrong about all this. And uh, um, if you want to make fun of my handwriting, that's fine too. All right. With that, have a good one.